If you've just got yourself a piece of land, whether you're launching out and becoming a farmer or you're starting your homestead or you've made a tree change, often you'll have sunk all your capital into getting the land. And odds are, sooner or later, you're gonna want another shed. Well, this is a way you can scrounge materials that are just lying around for free and repurpose it into making st structural engineered beams for a basic shed. It won't save you time, but it will save you money. G'day, my name's Stuart Chignall and welcome to my channel. Uh, if you're a returning subscriber, extra welcome because it's always good to have friends come back. Um, and also a big shout out to the guys at the Woodworking Crazy Facebook group because to a large degree, the way I've done this video is in response to your comments. Um, when I posted a photo of the beam, the one that's in the thumbnail, comment on that in that group, it went off. Um, so this was gonna be a video where I just show people what I was doing and hey, isn't it cool? Look, it works, but I'm gonna to have to go into more detail. But before I do that, I'm gonna show you what I've done. Now I started off with this piece of ply. I was cleaning up the yard because um, we had to do some, some media stuff. I had some TV crews coming in, so we we're trying to tidy the place up a little bit. Obviously, <laughs> it wasn't showing them this, it was the other side of the house. Um, and uh, yeah, I picked up this piece of plywood. It was pretty rubbishy. Um, it had this big curve in it, a few nails. Uh, one, side of the, one side of the ply wasn't weathering too well. I was about to throw it out. I thought, actually, no, I can use that for the woodshed that I need to build. First step was I cut it into 200 mil wide strips. Um, no engineering involved in this. It was just, I thought, well, that's overkill. Once I had the strips apply, I then needed some, uh, some longer bits of wood for the top and the bottom of the composite frame, which I pulled out of a skip. And when you're doing a lot of this stuff, it's about keeping an eye out for what's in your area. Um, here's another example of some material that would be really good for what we're doing here. Um, long, thin, wooden packaging material. You know, but you could just get away with knocking down pallets. Um, it's just, it's what you can find. None of the long bits of wood I had were quite long enough, so I just grabbed what I had, put it down, and if it wasn't, if it wasn't the right length, I just cut another bit until it was the right length, which was 3.8 meters. Put the first piece down, put a piece of ply on top of it, put the, another piece of wood on top of that, put the first nail into the cord. Some of the holes I pre-drilled, pre others I didn't. Um, uh, a lot of the ones that I didn't pre-drill I wish I had because the nails didn't drive straight a lot of the time. Ah! Sort of went askew and you know you can see that later and some of them haven't gone in as well as it would have been good, as well as I would have liked. Um, and then I just proceeded along the length, adding on the next piece of the cord, adding on the next piece of ply, nailing it down. Once I'd nailed the, the a cord on one side, I then flipped it over and nailed nails in from the other side. So I've got nails doing this. The nails weren't quite long enough to punch all the way through and come out the other side, but they were pretty close. So when they're going in from either side, it just creates a stronger joint rather than putting the nails in all from one side. Alrighty. Once I'd finished by attaching all the pieces of wood to each other, nailing from both sides, I then ran um, the beam over a stump and re-nailed all the pieces to get them to get the, the joints really nice and tight. Um, working on the ground like that, you could often be a little bit uneven, and you, sometimes your nailing can be a bit loose. So passing it over something solid just tightens things up. Uh, and with these nails, because they've got the corkscrew in them, um, it, you know they, they really hold hold really well. Explaining what I've done, I haven't given you many details. I've just explained the process, and that's because this is not a how-to video. This is a what's possible video. The reason for that is it's not possible for me to really tell you how to do this because I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know what sort of span you're going to, you need to span. I don't know what sort of load you want to put on these, on what you're building. But most importantly, I don't know what materials you're going to scrounge. Some could be incredibly strong. Some might be really weak. Like some pine packaging materials are very, very weak, especially if they've got lots of knots in them and so on. Um, some plywoods are very, very thin. Some are very, very thick. Uh, so this is really just a starting point to give you an introduction to what's possible. 
to do this for yourself, you're going to need to, you know, you're going to need to learn a bit more. And some of what you're going to need to learn is a bit of the theory about what's going on. But before we get into the theory, did the beam work? How strong is it? Well, let's see. Alrighty, moment of truth. Now what I'm using for our gauge is, um, well, three bits of wood that are held together by some door magnets. All right, what we get? 10 mil, 11 mil deflection. Let's be conservative. Let's reset that. So the door magnets holding the piece of wood together will allow the center piece of wood to slide down when I'm on top of the beam. That says 11 mil again to me. So three times out of three, I reckon we'll call it. So the beam works. Now admittedly, I'm not particularly heavy. I might be tall, but I only weigh about 85 kilos. Uh, so me standing in the middle of the beam is not a huge load, but only 10, 11 mils of deflection on a 3.8 meter span. That's awesome. You know, that is, that is, that's great. And especially considering when I show you where I'm gonna install it, the span's not actually that big. So yeah, that beam's gonna do the job I needed to do hands down. Now, if there's any engineering engineers watching this and they see me do the deflection test and, and say, hey, look, it's, it's strong enough, immediately, um, if they were concerned citizens, like the guys at the Woodworking Crazy Facebook group, they would immediately chime in and say, hey, you can't base, you can't tell if a beam's strong enough based on deflection. And that is absolutely correct. Say for a floor, if you walk on it and it, and it deflects a lot, it might be perfectly strong enough to support you, but it's gonna move, it's gonna bounce every step you take. People, for some reason, tend to get freaked out by that in buildings. So it's written into the building code that floors need to be stiffer than ceilings or even roofs, even though it's the roof that could very well be the one, be the thing that's got the load on it. Uh, your roof is, might be designed, only designed for a one in 180 deflection, which allows quite a lot of deflection. Um, and it's gonna get that load if you live in a snow area, whereas the floor is built to a much higher spec to stay stiff. Conversely, you might have a beam that is very, very stiff, very, very rigid, almost no deflection and it's not strong enough for the job that you ask of it. For example, when I was doing the engineering calculations for the um, Apple Cider Press, which I've got a series of videos on you can check out, there was almost no deflection under a 25 ton point load with, a pair, with paired 6x6s. But I had to go up to 10x12s, paired 10x12s, before the beam, those beams would pass um, were strong enough to resist the bending moment and the, and, the, and the shear that was in the beams from that load. So why am I saying, yay, it's strong enough based on the deflection? Three reasons. One is, I've done this a bunch of times. I've got some experience in knocking things together like this and then still being around 10 years later, 15 years later, longer, uh, longer. Second is that a 200 mil deep beam, or rafter in this case, is a, is a pretty big piece of timber for the span that I need it to do. It would be, a very, would be very over spec for the span I needed to do. So even if this is an inferior quality beam, it's still, it's a big beam relative to the job. So, you know, there's a, there's a margin of error in there. But the last thing, and the thing that gives me the most confidence, is that the nature of the construction, just nailing the bits together, means that the beam's not going to be very stiff. All the composite parts are held together with nails. Every nail is just going to move a little bit. There's going to be a little bit of you know, ease and give when a load's put onto it, which is going to increase the amount of deflection that the beam experiences. Given that, that a beam like this is going to deflect more than 
say a glued beam or you know a solid piece of wood, the fact that it's only deflecting 11 millimeters over a 3.8 meter span, that's what gives me the real com that's what gives me confidence as well. It's it's the it's so little deflection when it should, if it was weak, deflect so much more. Because it's not going to be the individual components that are bending and flexing. It's going to be the where they join together. And if there's that little deflection with this, I'll admit, relatively shoddy, hasty, dodgy construction. This is this is not a work of art. This is not fine German engineering or Japanese joinery. You know, this is just knocked together for a woodshed. So it's the next morning, and I've um, I've just finished editing the video to the to the next point. Sun's not sun's not up yet, but it's getting a bit long. If I'm also going to go into theory, um, and considering that as it turns out, I've been uh, booted from the Woodworking Crazy uh, Facebook group. When you're improvising, rather than using a standard cookie cutter solution like from a span table or like following a building code, you need to know a little bit more about the theory if you're gonna be doing things safely. That means that sometimes when you're doing stuff, it might, it's gonna look unconventional to people or even in this case, shoddy. So I get that and okay, I've got, I. I would perfectly willing to take the patience to explain what I'm doing, cop some more flack and just to, to go through it with people. But not if they're not willing to engage. So on that note, this will be, um, I'm going to be signing off. Um, in other things though, um, I'm running a competition at the moment where you can win a, um, controversially, uh, where you can win either a carpentry axe or a hewing axe and if so if you want to check that out um, there'll, there'll be a link in the description or on the screen somewhere and if you want to see the beam actually installed and in use and what I'm doing with it then make sure you subscribe and hit the bell notification icon so that you get notified when that when the videos come out um, and also to show you that composite beams like this which you can knock together yourself don't have to be but ugly, this is the beam that's gonna be at the very front of the shed where everyone can see it. And as you can see, that's much prettier. American red oak with Australian spotted gum webbing. Um, yeah, uh, and I think that looks pretty cool and not at all dodgy. And before any, and before any engineer says, hey, but you've got a butt joint in the, in the cord, that's the high moment area, which it is, and so legitimate concern, there's gonna be a support here. And before anyone goes on and say, look, you're using inch and a half, 32 by 32 mil things as posts. Yes, I am. And it is perfectly strong enough if you do it right. It's not standard construction because it's not economical because generally, generally time is money and you know, it's just easier, cheaper to use more wood. So let me know what you think. If you're gonna criticize what I'm doing, my technique, okay, that is fine, but keep it civil. I'm the first to admit that I don't know everything, but before you really go hammer and tongs, especially if you're gonna get you're getting into the theory, um, unless you're an engineer and actually knows what you're talking about, you make sure you know your facts, because um, I'm better educated than the average bear. Um, and I can, ha I can discuss these issues intelligently with fully qualified engineers. They not, might not approve of my application, but they do understand that I understand what I'm doing. And I understand that because I'm self-taught, there are gaps in my knowledge. Um, you don't know what you don't know. And one of the ways that I've used to educate myself um, throughout my life is I'll read and study and learn and, and ask questions, and then I'll just go for it. And then I'll show people what I've done. Sometimes everything works and hurrah, it's a success. Other times it doesn't. Other times more educated people, more knowledgeable people, more skillful people come along and say, hey, that was a bad idea. And then I'm the better educated for it. And next time well, I'll do it better. So if you are an engineer and you've watched this all the way through to this point, um, speak up, you know, if you think I am doing something drastically, drastically wrong, say so, and we'll talk about it. And if you're making like a horse shelter or a goat shelter or a hay shed, 
you know, once you once you get a handle on what you're doing and you learn, and once you get a handle on what you're doing and 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 how to how to do this stuff, you can do that too, and you don't have to go and buy a commercially made shed. Um, personally, though, I'd rather have the money to go and buy a commercially made shed, but I don't have the money, and there's lots of other people that don't too. So have fun. I'll see you online. This is not a how-to video. This is a what is possible video. Ah, all right. Oh, that's harsh. That's really harsh. What are they said now? Oh, they're not being nice to me. Are you, gonna, are you coping okay with that? Yeah, I'll be fine. I'm a big boy. Maybe you should go to the cycle. <laughs> <laughs>